美国中文电视。美国中华艾滋基金会会长，也是本次讲座的主讲人之一的内科医生王元聪，及主讲嘉宾董思美医生介绍说，他们希望通过自己求学和从医的经历，展示给青少年们作为参考，以帮助青少年们不走弯路。主要目的是想给我们这个亚裔，呃，尤其是华裔的下一代孩子，啊，一些启发，一些激励，啊，让让他们能够啊。知道有很多东西是可以做得到的，不是做不到。只要你努力就可以成功。Um, and so、um, I'm gonna maybe show my own path and use that as a springboard for or the you know allowing the youth to imagine what might be the possibilities for them in the future. 美国亚裔青少年计划的主席周艳霞表示，亚裔青少年计划在未来也将举办更多类似的讲座，以帮助有意从事其他行业的亚裔青少年。那我们啊，艾斯比基金会。的这个亚裔这个青年少年计划呢，将不断的呃推出啊、呃、不同的这种啊、呃、题目，呃，除了这一次的在医学方面的呃这些导师以外，呃，我们在未来呢，甚至还会推出有关于在金融方方面或者在法律方面。参与活动的家长都对活动表示了肯定，他们认为让孩子多参与这样的活动，可以让孩子接触到更多未来职业的潜在可能。Of course, I think having Asian leaders, Asian physicians and surgeons and doctors. Uh, gives them an example of what you can accomplish. It's、uh, much easier for them to relate to someone who looks like them, who share the same culture, who share the same background. 活动同时向六名获得二零一七年第三届亚裔学生写作、绘画、及微电影优胜的学生颁发奖牌和奖学金。来美近三年的尤安生以加强中美文化交流为题的作文获得了写作奖。他表示，奖项鼓励了他，让他更有信心在未来宣传中华文化。对，他是对我对嗯中国文化的肯呃的一个认同的一种肯定，并且我也愿意在以后的时间里，嗯，对嗯中国文化的传承做出努力。对我以后准备在大学里面，嗯，创建一个中国文化的一个社团，并且将文化发扬光大。美国中文电视郭凯南报道。
uh, at this point, can I ask my uh, honorable guest speaker to come to the front and uh, sitting on the stage to be ready? So let me have the uh, uh, Dr. Ling. All right, Dr. Ling. And let's have a Dr. You know, Judy Tang. And Dr. Vincent Wang. Just make yourselves comfortable. Do you want me to bring some drink or? You have. How about you, Dr. You are good? Okay. So, good afternoon, uh, dear parents students, and our honorable guest speakers, and of course my beloved uh, CAP board members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very, very welcome you come to the, our second uh, the, uh, leadership forum. And this is hosted by the uh, uh, CAP China F Fund, the Asian Youth the Program. Uh, on behalf of the uh, China F Fund, I would like to extend in the uh, our warmest welcomes and express our heartfelt you know, gratitude for your presence at this memory, uh, memorable occasion. Uh, before we start it, you know, I would like to you know, just uh, give you a little bit, you know, just like the information, uh, what's about the uh, China Ed Fund. The name sounds very prestigious, you know, but what is the exact mission we are doing? And how about the Asian American Youth Programs? Uh, what we have you know, accomplished. Uh, later, we're going to have a award ceremony, and that's one of our very, very Marina successful Gordon. accomplishments you know, of all the outstanding students. So let me start with the, uh, the CAP, you know, China Ad Fund. Uh, China Ad Fund you know, uh, is um, starting about the uh, 2000, I would say 2002, and our honorable chairwoman uh, will be here um, in uh, a moment. The American, uh, the Asian American Youth Program, is a youth community-based program supported by the nonprofit organizations China Ed Fund. And this program itself, all right, uh, we would, you know, the main purpose you know, of this program to help the youth to turn their experience of the diversity into the strengths and growth in the self-awareness, and then become a part of a large community. That will inspire others to reach their full potential as leaders and the thinkers. And that's where we have so many uh, leaders, all potential leaders uh, in our community. Uh, this is full round, okay? This will be our second time. And for next year, uh, we want to set up you know, a series of the full round. Uh, for example, uh, on the, uh, the June 4th, our first one, uh, we invite the uh, assembly women and uh, we invite you know, our uh, honorable chairman, okay, uh, Charlie Swan, to share their you know, personal experience. And this year we have all the prestigious you know, speakers now they are sitting on the stage. Uh, you're going to listen to them you know, uh, very soon. And we, today so we're going to focus on the uh, medical you know, area. And in the future we're going to focus on the business, the finance, many things, you name it. Uh, we want to hear from you. Okay, the parents, uh, I believe that you are the backbone for the other students, you know, success. So we want to hear from you, we want to hear from the students, what would you would like to, you know, have the CAP AEYP program to run the workshop for you. So we're really looking forward, you know, hearing from you. So without further ado, uh, let me, you know, starting uh, the uh, open remark uh, by our uh, our the, uh, uh, chairman, okay, that will be Dr. Liang. So can we just uh, help the, uh, ask the Dr. Liang, our the, uh, the chairman, you know, to come out to say the open remark. Dr. Liang. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to um, Youth Leadership Forum. This is our second event in 2017. Um, for those who don't know China Aid Fund, let me give you a brief introduction because I started uh, with them in 2003. Um, China Aid Fund is a nonprofit organization uh, that was founded in 2003. The initial mission was to help China to fight HIV. At that time, it was becoming an epidemic in any way that we can, possibly can. And a few years later, the board of directors decided to expand the mission of China Aid Fund 
to not only just help HIV uh, people, but also to help needy children in China, and also to promote Chinese tradition, culture, and also to inspire young people in America, uh, those with Asian American <coughs> background, to become leaders of the future for our community. And that's why we are here today. To sum up, China Aid Fund has two programs right now in China and two programs in New York. The two programs in China include, one is collaboration with two schools in Sichuan, working with the school teachers and school master to help the HIV orphan to stay in school and to excel academically so that eventually they can turn their lives around. And the second project that we have in China is to open and build libraries in remote villages to help the poor village uh, children to learn more about uh, literature, to learn more about uh, language, to learn whatever they are missing there from their school, because their school uh, in, in those villages are, are very, very low standard. <clears throat> in New York, we have two programs as well. The first one was established three years ago is a scholarship competition program. And it is, um, the topics is also around uh, being an Asian American, uh, the hardship of growing up, and the, um, and, uh, the, the challenges they can, they, they, that they face on a daily basis. And the second project that we have is this Youth Leadership Forum today. And the idea of this Youth Leadership Forum is to promote Chinese tradition, Chinese culture, and also to inspire the young generation of New York uh, to become leaders and advocates of our community. Um, today, we ha our topic is focused on medicine, and we have three very successful doctors here with different backgrounds, and to share their life experience with you. From my point of view, it's not the topics that's important, even though they're all from medicine. But by sharing their life experience with you, for the young people and for the parents alike, you will learn how to face the challenge in life, how to plan a better future for yourself, and how to become a leader of our community in the future. So even if you are not interested in medicine today, or if you're interested in medicine today, of course it's going to be great. Uh, you will learn something today, and um, I think it will be a very, very <coughs> valuable lesson for, for all, of, all of you today. <clears throat> I also have two other special announcements to make. One is Dr. ming De Chan is here today. Dr. ming De Chan is our executive vice president. Today is her birthday, so I have to say happy birthday to her. And she's spending the birthday with us, not with her family. The second announcement... <laughs> <laughs> the second announcement I want to make is Tiffany at Americana Manhattan has been our sole sponsor of this event uh, since the beginning. Today we are happy to have the manager, Melina Gordon, and her associate, uh, Serena Yen. They are here to participate in our program and they will be helping us to present the award to our speakers today. Uh, so please give them a warm welcome. You know, I always respect him. You know, anytime we come to stage, he will cover everything that I need to say, you know, so I can be just relaxed and just, you know, move on. Um, you know, um, so besides the, all the uh, distinguished, you know, the guest speakers who are sitting on the stage, uh, I also want to uh, just to introduce uh, our partners, you know, um, the, uh, the CAP, the board members, and AYPs, you know, uh, the committee members. So, uh, I would like to just uh, introduce them, let them know all the hard work they have to put in. So the first one is on the stage is our president of the CAP, that's Dr. Vincent Wang. Thank you. <laughs> and our lady girls, you know, that's Dr. Minder Young. Yeah, Dr. Minders. <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, the one just you know standing here and uh, just support that's our chairman, you know, Dr. Liang. I'm going to introduce you again, Dr. Liang. <laughs> And our co two co chairmen, uh, one is Dr. Vincent Kwong. Uh, sorry, Dr. Jason Kwong. <laughs> Jason Kwong. And the other is our attorney, um, that will be Mrs. Um, the Nana Choi. Nana? Yeah. And of course, um, most humble, you know, Dr. Dr. Hunt, uh, where are you? You know, I will try to, uh, Dr. Hunt. Thank you. 
and including myself. Uh, my name is Yen Chu. I'm the chairwoman of the AEYP uh, program. It's uh, been a pleasure to working with all this uh, wonderful and you know, successful uh, doctors, and to be able to work out you know such a great you know program. And um, well, without the further ado, uh, I guess you know everybody's waiting for this uh, leadership forum to you know really start you know officially. So um, I'm going to introduce in our former ambassador scholarship winner to come uh, to the stage to introduce you know one of each our speaker. So first one I'm going to introduce is Kristen Hong, is 2015 ambassador scholarships you know recipient. Yeah, Kristen, come up. So Dr. Ning Ling is an award-winning neurosurgeon who brings a unique combination of neurosurgical and endovascular experience in treating a wide range of vascular diseases of the brain and the spine with an expertise in the treatment of cerebrovascular disorders. Upon graduating from Duke University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Bioengineering, Dr. Lin received the prestigious Leonardo da Vinci Award and went on to obtain his doctorate degree from Harvard Medical School having graduated cum laude. Dr. Lin finished neurosurgery residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital, where he served as its chief resident and obtained fellowship training in endovascular neurosurgery and interventional neuroradiology at the Gates Vascular Institute, SUNY Buffalo. Throughout his distinguished medical career at New York Presbyterian and Wild Cornell Medical Center in Manhattan, and at New York Presbyterian Queens in Flushing, Dr. Lin was the recipient of many accolades including the Neurosurgery Research and Education Foundation Fellowship Award and Research Updates in Neuroscience for Neurosurgeons Award. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Ning Lin. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm truly humbled by that wonderful introduction, and I don't know if that's really myself. But, um, so uh, I want to thank uh, all the organizers, Dr. Liang, Dr. Minkir Chen, Dr. Wong, Honorary Chairwoman, and to uh, to invite me here to share some experiences, mostly personal, with uh, everybody here. Um, you know, I want to keep this short. Um, I uh, I was born in Beijing, and I, I grew up in China. Uh, my parents have been here much longer than I did, and I sort of stayed behind and with my grandparents. And I think that experience probably was not entirely unique, and many folks over here may have something like that. Um, so growing up with grandparents has its unique advantages and disadvantages. Um, and although I was the only child by my parents, but I grew up with a whole bunch of cousins, and uh, uh, some older than me, some younger than me. So that does not really make me feel like I'm the only child. So I think that's an advantage. Uh, upon graduating from high school, I, I migrated here and joined my parents. Um, went to college and medical school. Uh, medicine is a uh, interesting career choice, and I think many of you guys will have decisions to make when you are at that stage of your college life. Um, I I want to let you know that I think medicine is a very very um, is a uniquely uh, satisfactory career choice uh, for folks who want to work with both technology and also humans. Uh, I think that's what really drew me into medicine, is that um, I had an engineering background. I did uh, biomedical engineering in undergraduate. But while I was doing all the programming, doing all the robotics, doing all the uh, uh, biological experiments, you know, that kind of human factor is somewhat lacking. So that's why I feel uh, choosing medicine is one opportunity to really incorporate all my interest and expertise in biological science into treating patients and that's to help other human beings. And that's really the a very unique aspect of medicine that I think that's never going to be forgotten. Um, as the world is changing very fast, there are many, many different career paths and I think there are many different uh, career choices that's as appealing as medicine is. But I think that unique aspect of human uh, part of medicine is something that makes us Career very special. Um, so uh, I look forward to uh, to to hear more about uh, everybody here's experiences and uh, um, your own uh, life path. Uh, and uh, I'm very honored to be here to share my experience with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ling. 
Uh, well, the reason she, you know, he couldn't read it so short because he's ready for the Q&A very soon, all right? So don't be hesitant. Any question you want to ask, you know, why you have an engineer background and then become choosing the, uh, the medicine as your career? Think about anything you want to ask. So uh, next one, uh, we're going to introduce, you know, our next guest speaker. But I would like to, you know, uh, ask our 2016 ambassador scholarships recipient, uh, that's Anna Liu, to come out to, you know, to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Judy Tang. So Anna, come up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so with a, a deep commitment and advocacy in providing patients with high quality, comprehensive primary care that prioritizes communication and continuity, Dr. Judy Tang is a leading academic general in internalist with a specialization in women's health and preventive medicine. A graduate of Wesleyan University, Dr. Chung embarked on her medical journey and received her doctorate degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. She then completed her internal medicine residency program at the University of California in San Francisco and was the chief resident in primary care internal medicine at university at the University of um, oh, at <laughs> New York University. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Um, in 2001, Dr. Chung began her exemplar, exemplary med medical tenure at Weill Cornell, where she was the director of uh, Weill, Weill Cornell Internal Medicine Associates at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell Medical Center, as well as faculty member. Dr. Chung continued to serve the medical community in many leadership positions within the institution including Associate Chair of Educational Affairs, Associate Director of the Internal Medicine Residency, Director of Primary Care Residency, and most recently in 2016, Chair of the Department of Medicine at the New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. She is the recipient of the J. James Smith Teacher of the Year, Teacher of the Year Award and the Award for Teaching Excellence. It is with great pleasure that I now welcome, welcome you to the stage, Dr. Judy Tuck. Thank you very much for having me today. It is a great honor to be with you. Um, so like um, the other speakers, I'm going to try to remember way, way back to when I was in your shoes and some of the uh, forks in the road that brought me here. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my parents were from Guangzhou originally, but grew up really in Taiwan, which is where I still have some family. And they raised me to prioritize uh, the service professions. And so I knew pretty much since I was a kid that I wanted to be either a teacher or a nurse or a doctor. Um, having an affinity for science, um, I chose the path of doctoring, um, but decided that because I was going to dedicate my life to science, that in fact I would try to do something a little different during my college years. So I went to Stuyvesant High School um, here in the city, and then from there went to Wesleyan University, which is of course a small liberal arts college in Connecticut, and uh, majored in sociology. I also danced and did a lot of fun things. Um, I then went straight to Albert Einstein Medical School up in the Bronx, and I chose that um, because it had a rich tradition in community service to the Bronx, and there I got a chance to become involved in many, many um, community service activities that really, I think, kept the humanistic side of me alive despite, of course, all of the grueling hours in the library and the textbooks. And then at the end of schooling, um, I decided that internal medicine primary care was where I most enjoyed um, being at the bedside, being around adult patients um, for any uh, treatment or any condition that ailed them and not, and you know, basically choosing breath over death. Um, my then boyfriend, now husband, actually matched to San Francisco, and so, um, and he went looking out west because I was interested in family medicine, and West Coast programs in family medicine are a little bit superior to East Coast ones, and so um, I wound up heading out to California for my residency. So he says he went out there for me. I say went out there for him. And I mention this because it was a pivotal moment in my career. I had done pretty much all of my decision making around what was good for my professional life. And that was the first time that I had to make a decision 
for my professional life around what was going to be good for my personal life. And of course, at that time, we were not yet married, and so it was a little bit of a leap of faith for me to be making such a big decision for a relationship that had no guarantees. But I think it's an important crossword that you will have to face in your life um, and that you should make with your heart. Um, at the end of three glorious years in San Francisco, we both came back to New York, which is where both of our families are. Um, I should say that my, um, uh, my father passed away at the age of 48 of colon cancer. Um, and my mother was a pretty traditional um, housewife with limited English speaking skills. And so really one of my first intimate relationships with medicine was serving as my father's translator and health advocate as he navigated the healthcare system. Um, and so it was important for me to reunite with my family and be around my widowed mother um, and around my siblings and similarly so for my husband. So we came back to New York. Um, and frankly, because residency is a pretty intense experience and there's not a lot of time to think about jobs, um, I took a chief resident year um, at NYU in order to figure it out. And in that year, I actually got to practice at Bellevue and at the Charles B. Wang um, Center um, and got to teach at Gouverneur. And so it was a, a beautiful year for me to be able to explore my future relationship with the um, Chinese community as potential patients, but also as a chief resident, which is mostly a teaching role, I got to explore my new love for education. Um, at the conclusion of that year, I went to Cornell, um, mostly because I felt that Cornell offered me the best balance in terms of my dedication to patient care, as well as my budding love for education. And um, for the first seven years at Cornell, I was an educator. I uh, was, again, the residency director for the primary care program, an associate program director for the categorical residency. These words may not mean anything to you right now, but I'm happy to counsel you on them in the future. And then it was actually wearing my educational hat that I got my first taste of administration because our hospital had to create what we call teaching services, that is patients cared for by the residents. Um, separate and apart from non-teaching services because we were actually outstripping our ability for our residents to take care of all of the patients. So again, wearing my educational hat, I got to foray into administration and help the hospital to carve out clinical pathways by which patients should come here versus there and how many extra doctors or uh, physician assistants we needed to hire in order to take care of those patients. Um, and that took a full years of actually negotiations and deep, deep understanding of operations and finance. Um, the conclusion of that year was that we actually created the division of hospital medicine, and then I was offered a promotion to serve as uh, chief of ambulatory medicine. I did that for the next five or six years um, and had two wonderful daughters, age 10 and 13 now. Um, and uh, and um, at the conclusion of that, we actually wound up reorganizing my division such that I had a little opportunity to look for what was next on my pathway. And then our hospital actually underwent a full asset merger, with, which is what is now the New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital, formerly New York Downtown Beekman, um, which, as you know, is a community hospital that has a very rich tradition of serving its community in Chinatown. And so, um, there, a couple of years into the merger, um, morale was not very high. I had very strong relationships with leadership in, on the Cornell campus, and so I was asked to go down and chair the department, mostly to work on uh, faculty retention and morale building, but also to look for the future into what growth strategies that hospital could offer, not only to the community that it's already had a tradition of serving, but then some additional ones. And so that's what I've been doing for the last year and a half. Um, I think um, some important lessons that I've learned along the way is that um, a career is something that you define looking backwards. I never planned to be a residency director or a medical director or a section chief or a chairman. I just knew that I wanted to, be, to do science and to help people and to be around like-minded individuals. And as I did that work, opportunities presented itself. So if you're ever offer, offered an opportunity, um, please say yes, because it'll bring surprising results for you. 
Um, and that you know, if you surround yourself with people who recognize where your heart is, and if you're not afraid to work a little hard and take a few risks, then you know, certainly not every single one of those opportunities will come to fruition as a promotion or as uh, an accolade, but um, you can't go wrong if you do your heart's work. Thank you, Dr. Tang. I, uh, I'm sure you already explained your whole life here. You know, we know you so well. And hopefully your wonderful two young daughter can also participate in our futures in ambassador scholarship programs. You know, just like a, like a daughter, like a mom. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we listen to the two, um, basically, you know, with the medical fields, you know, experts. Uh, please uh, prepare your question because we are going to uh, focus on, you know, uh, the Q&A a lot. I think in less than two events, you know, uh, some of us will, you know, copy exactly, you know, their past. But I believe that the, uh, their experience, you know, their feedback can be a great experience, you know, to, uh, to be a mentor, you know, for you. Uh, we have the uh, microphone, you know, already set up on the side. Uh, that's ready for the Q&A section, okay? So um, don't be shy, okay? Uh, look at all of the, you know, speakers sitting here. They are not shy. So you have to, you know, concur. You have to be a, you know, outspoken person, you know, before uh, become a leader. Uh, next, um, I will get the speaker. Uh, you're going to listen a wonderful story because uh, a lot of our uh, press have been listening to your story and uh, everybody listen to uh, watching your news. You say, wow, doctor can be a fisherman, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's a wonderful thing I guess to share. Uh, we're going to like you can come up to share with us this story again with many of the audience here. But, you know, just one second, I'm going to introduce our 2017 Ambassador, you know, scholarships, you know, uh, receiving Felicia Yao to come up to introduce our dear, you know, Dr. Vincent Wang. Okay, Felicia, come on. Dr. Wang immigrated to the United States from Hainan Province, China, where he received a doctorate degree from the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. He completed his internal medicine residency training at New York Hospital Medicine Center of Queens and was later appointed as medical director for the hospital's early treatment for the Minic Patients Unit as well as a teaching faculty member for his residency and physician assistance program. Dr. Wang then served as medical director of Flushing Hospital Medica Medical Center's culturally sensitive hospitalist program. With 10 years of medical practice, Dr. Wang established a thriving primary care practice that focuses on providing quality-driven inpatient and outpatient care with emphasis on overall wellness. Dr. Wang firmly believes that given the, the, dyna the, the, given the dynamic of the rapidly changing U.S. healthcare system, Members of the physician community needs to stand united in the forefront in providing the best service to the general public with the patient's best interest at hand. Dr. Wang has been very active in the physician and medical community where he's currently president of the Association of Chinese American Physicians as well as the board lead director of the Federation of Chinese American and Chinese Canadian Medical Societies. Dr. Wong was also a former executive board member of American Cancer Society Asian Initiative. In addition to work in the medical field, Dr. Wong has been active in various charitable organizations, including Chinese Aid Fund, China Aid Fund, where he is currently its executive vice president and senior president of the International Pen Pal Program, a remarkable initiative that allows children from the United States to have the eye-opening opportunity to tra travel and connect with children and orphans affected by the HIV or AIDS virus in the Henan province of China. It is with great pleasure that I now present to you to the stage, Dr. Mr. Wong. Welcome. Lovely introduction. Um, Actually, today is my daughter Cassie's birthday too. Oh, Surprise! Nice. <laughs> Happy birthday to her. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I actually tried to prepare. I'm never a good public speaker, so um, um, since uh, I think two months ago, I've been uh, getting my heart rate up. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. 
for coming, listening to his uh, forum talk. And um, just two months ago, when I tried to volunteer, my, volunteer myself as a speaker, I didn't worry about it. Because look at who the speaker we have here. We have Dr. Judy Tang, a big academ academic physician who are uh, running a medicine uh, program. Uh, chairman of the Department of Medicine in, in the uh, downtown hospital, and we have a neurosurgeon um, who graduated from Duke and Harvard, big academic people, and uh, I, as a internist, I always call myself a lowly internist. Uh, it's very hard for me to come up with something prestige, but I then I decided to say, hey, let me tell my story about how I get into this, uh, uh, how I struggle with this system, become a doctor. Um, and uh, it's funny, the last Sunday we have a news conference and uh, World Journal come up with a, uh, an article. <laughs> <laughs> the topic is very funny. It said, Hua Yi Lun Wei Mai Yu Lang. I I read the article. It's it's actually pretty accurate from most part. It's just a little dramatic, dramatic on the on the uh, title. So I send that to the to my friends in the WeChat group and a friend of mine, who Dr. Dr. Zengbao Huang, who's also an internist, geriatrician, he said that, "Well, my boy, you the reason can this is how reason." So now this, uh, I think the Chinese uh, supermarket the fish selling department uh, in high demand. There are a lot of people looking for job there. <laughs> you know, so let's uh, get started. Um, so I came to the United States in 1995 when I was uh, 29 years old, after being a surgeon in China for six years. Uh, don't know anything. To, what, what, what can I do? So in August 1995, after settling down, I started thinking, because my wife was a nurse there from back then. Uh, she was able to support the family, support the family. And I have uh, the luxury of saying, hey, let me see what I can do uh, in the future. So we have a discussion in the family, and everybody is not sure because, you know, being a doctor, you know, in the United States, it's almost impossible. Someone who come here when he was 29 years old, going back to medical school, it's tough. So at the end, I said, let's let's uh, see what we can do first. Let's study medicine, study some English. So I went to Brooklyn College, do my ESL, and then, uh, later on I go to church uh, with my wife to Brooklyn. We lived in Brooklyn back then. So uh, some friends in the church said, you know what, you can actually. As a, as a medical graduate from China, you can actually take the board exam and become a doctor here. So it's all of a sudden I get so excited. It's, oh, yes, that's good. Let me go for it. So, but they said, you, your school has to be in the, um, in the Green Bowl. So which Green Bowl? Is that the book that World Health Organization listed the medical school that, graduate, uh, that you graduate from, if your school is left, listed in there, then you're qualified. So my medical school is like the third tier medical school in China, Hainan Medical College. So I'm not quite sure. But me and my wife, I still remember very clear that the two of us just go to the library and, you know, where we can, can find a book for a library, so public library in Fifth Avenue, and searching for it. So the main library, there's, oh, there's no such book here. So we go to the small library uh, across the street, and finally we found a little green book. My school is listed there. I was like, wow, that's good. We can well, let me go for it now, right? So with very uh, little broken English, I, I started to try to study medicine. And went to Boston Novel, buy some book. So went to Boston Novel to, to look for books to buy and uh, realized that this is an educational center called Kaplan. So we, I went to Kaplan myself. And uh, I still remember very clearly this one. To, that's 2016, early 2016. I walked into Kaplan, uh, actually late 2015. I walked into Kaplan and, and, and uh, tried to ask for information. And this uh, guy, 
on the street, uh, on the hallway, he is uh, working for Kaplan, and I said, um, excuse me, I, I used to be a doctor in China. And the guy looked at me and laughed. So I was shocked. Why, why is he laughing at me? We're kind of trying to run away, right? So he said, sir, once you're a doctor, you're always a doctor. So, so I kept, let me go for it. So um, I used uh, hard-earned money from my wife, two thousand dollars, to register the course. And from that point on, we I ride bicycle every day. Go to I used to live in Brooklyn, so they have site and site in uh, Kings Highway, Brooklyn. So every day I pack my lunch, a backpack, and ride a bicycle from then from Sunset Park all the way all the way down to. Pink's Highway to the site to uh, study, learn, and study. So by 2016, I passed step one. Uh, it's very hard, you know, up to leaving schools for seven, seven, eight years, learning just the USMRU step, step one. We all know it's basic science, right? Chemistry, biochemistry, anatomy, everything. So plus you learn it in Chinese. We learn it in Chinese, so I have to translate everything into English. So it's kind of hard. So but I overcome it. By uh, destroying two uh, dictionary, you know, medical dictionary from Chinese and English, and then uh, 2017, I wasn't that lucky. I take twice to pass step two, so that is uh, setting up a bad uh, things for me. So I, after you pass step two, you can apply for residency. So 2017, and when uh, I start applying for medic. Uh, the residency program. I still remember uh, Cassie, my daughter was born in 2016, uh, November 5th, which is today. And 19. 19. 19. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 1996. <laughs> Go back one millennium. <laughs> uh, so uh, 1996, November 5th. Uh, that's Clinton get elected by a second term. And yeah, I remember so clear. So on, the, to the, on 1917, when I start applying for residency, I basically apply for anything, anything. 19, 1997, sorry. 1997. I'm very bad in it. In, 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 you know, sometimes we still uh, think with uh, Chinese when you uh, count. So I try to do, as, but we still, sometimes you miss seven and six, right? Six and seven. We always mix it up when you for those who uh, English is a second language you do that sometimes so anyhow 1997 uh, so over 400 program package back then we don't have electronic uh, uh, application or systems it's all paper I type up and print up about over 400 applications and I still remember I used my daughter's uh, diaper box and a shopping cart dragged them all the way to the post office to mail them out. It cost a lot of money. It cost me back then over $400 to mail those things out. It, it's like throwing a rock in the ocean. Nothing. So I go ahead and take the step three in 1998. And when, uh, yeah, 1998. Ah, I got it right. Um, when my son was born, and holding my breath, no response. So uh, it was quite a dark era in my life. So after you take all the tests, you work so hard, you know, pass them, and couldn't uh, get any interview. And my friend, uh, Dr. Lisa Eng, uh, back then was, uh, was uh, she was the one who delivered both of my baby, so we get to know her. And she said, let me get, see if we can get you an interview. So she, as Brookdale Hospital, uh, no, uh, Lutheran Hospital uh, for interview, and I was able to get a scramble interview, but after the interview, the same thing, the rock broke in the ocean. So, um, so in the beginning of 2000, uh, 1999, uh, after the matching day, the matching day is what, March, right? Yeah. After the matching day, well, I got nothing. nothing. A friend of mine who went to Nikon as a as an accelerated program, 
he called me up and said, hey, Vincent, what's, go what's going on? His name also is Vincent. Very strange. Uh, so he said, uh, I said, well, nothing. I, no result. What, what can I do? He said, well, why don't you come to uh, NICA, uh, the New York, Hospital, uh, New York College of Osteopathic Medicine? They have a program for uh, about 40 spots for the foreign graduates. So uh, I was thinking about it and said, yeah, why don't we try, right? So I got nothing else to do. I can't do, I can't get into any program, record, program, program, never receive, never accept any phone call anyway. So uh, there's really no way to go. Uh, it's very very desperate. So, so I said, okay, let me come take a look. I go to the, the school. It's, it's really nice. So I said, she said, he said, if you come to the school, you get accepted as a student, you actually get your doctor's degree here, you become an American graduate, which is actually solved the whole problem because that's the problem of mine, of me, is I'm a foreign graduate. It's very hard to get into residency here as a foreign graduate. I'll talk to you a little bit uh, later about what I did after that. Um, so, send in applications, uh, waiting, 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 in the, it's around, uh, a late May, late April and May in 1999, uh, no no news. So I call up the school and say, "Hey, I submit my application. So I just wonder uh, uh, what's going on." Uh, he said, "Well, you're not you're not selected for the interview. So apparently, it's about there's about uh, four several hundred applications they have, and they select 200." Uh, candidates for interview. I'm not in the selected uh, list, so uh, I was quite, you know, you'll see, very hard, very hard. So um, I was thinking, but one day I was sitting there, I just don't know what to do, so I uh, drive myself to the, to, to the school and walk to the admission office upstairs on the fourth floor, and I went to the, the secretary for, uh, for the, the admission office, uh, Mrs. Swartz, I still remember her name. I said, Miss um, Ward, um, I submit my application. I think I'm, I really love this school. You know, you have no choice. You have to say you love this school, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I really, uh, really appreciate uh, if you can give me an opportunity. So she looked up at me and said, "Wait a minute, you speak very good English." I said, "Yeah." <laughs> well, your application is written in Chinese. I said, "Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I need to translate them, right?" Anyhow, that's a joke. <laughs> so she uh, had a nice talk with her. She said, okay, go home, honey. Uh, just wait for my phone call. As soon as I head home, I hit home, the phone rang and said, uh, come tomorrow for the interview. So I went, thank you. Actually, it was a little twist, actually. I didn't want to tell you. I walk up there, that's a whole story. I walk up there to, 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 the, to, Sh to Ms. Schwartz and she said, you know, you're not selective. So I go down, go to this, go almost to the parking lot, wandering around the street, uh, around the, 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 you know, on the parking lot. I said, wait a minute, if, if I can't get this, I, there's no way I can go, right? I don't know where to go. So I actually walked back and talked to her. That's where the conversation come up from. <laughs> so that's a, a very scary story for most people who are in desperate situation anyway. So yes, I got an interview and I get accepted into the summer program 80 of, uh, out of these 200 get selected into the summer program, and out of this 80, 40 uh, get admitted. So this 40, how do you do that? Two weeks uh, summer program study, uh, biochemistry, actually organic chemistry, physics, and anatomy, all those things, those are basic science in English. And the top 40, and you take tests twice a week, every subject twice a week. The top 40 get in. Guess what number I am? Number three. Wow. Uh, I got you, and everything, everything goes going smoothly. Uh, become a for, uh, uh, American graduate. For three years down, we get the, uh, I graduated. I went to uh, NYPQ. Uh, actually, it was uh, NYHQ back then. Uh, Dr. Terry Brady was my, my program director. So I uh, went through three years. I, I figure I, uh, I was thinking about applying for specialists, you know, Medicine is uh, it's an ocean. You can learn a lot of different things. Which way to go? So I think about this and I said, 
I want to just stay, stay as a medicine general practice because you're going to different specialties, uh, you sort of have to, number one, spend more years. I'm getting older. You know, I was 20, I was 36 by the time. So I said, I'm getting older. I can't go for any more subspecialties. So that's what I uh, did. Um, not a very uh, fun story to listen to, but I think it, it's, uh, it's something I want to share with people. Um, after finishing my residency, I actually uh, stayed for the teaching uh, job for two, two years, and I went to Long Island for a full-time hospitalist in uh, St. Kirsten's Hospital. And then I came back to help watching to do this hospitalist program. In the meantime, I established my practice. I'm very uh, involved in the Chinese community physicians. Most of the Chinese physicians in, in the community, they went through a lot, not just, uh, not just me. They are, I know some of them will uh, take out food delivery and all kind of things. We do what we can to achieve what we want to achieve. So uh, everybody uh, is working very hard. And so I basically try to help out the, all, all these people, the upcoming Chinese graduates. So I, get into ACAP, become the ACAP uh, board member, become the president. Uh, Dr. Lisa Eng actually held this uh, mock interview to help the Chinese medical graduate every year. I participated every year. We helped them out because where I, uh, where I was, there's no such help. So they, uh, I think after we've been through, I, we realized that a lot of people need help. We go help. And the, it's the same reason I, I joined uh, China AIDS Fund uh, with Thanks to Dr. Liang who introduced me to the board, and I'm very happy to be part of these uh, great organizations. And, and this Asian Youth Program, um, it's been great. I uh, congratulate all the winners. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Wong. But I have to tell you, you know, it sounds like he went through all the hardship in his life, but your condition looks so great. How can that possible, you know? <laughs> one, hour, one hour a day. Okay, one thing a day. Well, you know, um, so now we have all the guest speakers finish their speech. We have a Dr. Ling, Dr. Tang, and then we have the Dr. Wang. And each one of them have uh, their own background, okay? Uh, Dr. Ling uh, went back to China, right? And come back as a uh, uh, junior high school? <coughs> so grew up in China. Oh, but I came here for college. Okay. And Dr. Tang, uh, you were born and raised here, right? Okay, and Dr. Wang, poor Dr. Wang. Have the doctor degrees, come here, just start with nothing, and now you become doctor today again. So each one of them have very, very, you know, I would say outstanding, you know, highlights of points. So now we're going to open the floor to the audience, okay? It's about the time to ask your own questions. And the first question I'm going to ask, Okay, I really, when I'm sitting there and listen to all of them, um, they always call me uh, Zhou Lao Shi, Mr. Chu. All right, um, when I came to the uh, United States, you know, I studied for the uh, computer science, you know, statistics and uh, mathematics. So uh, I, uh, you know, finished the certificate you know, for the uh, uh, edge area. So I always look at myself at golden careers and making a whole ton of money. And in the end, I become a teacher. Yes? And I've become involved with the education, you know, for almost in my entire whole life. So sometimes, you know, men propose and God what is for. So you never know what's going to happen. So the question for the three guest speakers. Now we are sitting here, we have all the parents, and we have the, all the, you know, youth. So if you want to give it a, just a very few sentences, okay, in their lives, how can we inspire them? How can we give them... Uh, a, a, sent, a few sentences, you know, and that will help them when they determine uh, what college they are going to, what career they are going for their you know, professional. Can we just have a few sentences and can you just uh, give them something as a guideline? Okay, so I'm going to start with you, Dr. Lee. Okay. Um, uh, well, I, 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 must, I must say something first. That I, I, I know Vincent for a while, but, uh, but that was a very touching personal story. I, I always admire your courage and hard work. That's probably the most important thing for anybody to achieve. That's you have a goal, you really work on it, and then you, you get to it eventually. That's that's very inspiring. Um, so 
I'll, I'll, I'll say this relatively, uh, I don't want to sound cliche, but essentially you need to make a personal or career choice uh, based upon sort of an experience that really touched your heart. Um, that, that you sort of understand what is the most important to you, and, and that you understand it's if you actually keep doing this kind of stuff that will make you happy. Um, this is not necessarily only a, a material base, it's not necessarily uh, only a prestige base, but if you, if you have found something that touches your heart and you know that doing this will make me satisfactory, and then we know that's something good I did, and that, that will make you, that, that's the, the uh, thing you should decide on. Um, I, I say this based upon some personal experiences, and I, I, from studying from school and all these, I, I would say the, uh, uh, the hard ex experience I had has nothing to, com to compare with uh, Vincent did, but um, we, in high school, I was in China, in high school, we had, a, uh, we had this chemistry lab and all these, and I was, I was a pretty good student, I sort of run that lab, and then um, we actually uh, tried to build something that's sort of uh, more advanced for, for a small exhibition and then we, we try to find chemicals to imitate them a volcano. And of course that's not something on a textbook and I just try to add some more medicine in it and then everything exposed. <laughs> and so so as a result I burned my hand, I burned my face. Uh, I was hospitalized for uh, a total of three weeks and I stayed out of school for six weeks. Um, and you know, in, in school, in high school, I'm sure this happens everywhere and I'm sure this happens to the parents sitting over there. In school, the number one thing to do is what? Is to get a best score, and then to get your GPA up to, to get your final exam to the A's. Uh, and that's what we all did in, uh, when I was in, in school too. Uh, but then you have those six weeks you are forced out of school, you can't study, and then you, you miss your friends, and you're sort of alone in a hospital bed for three weeks. And that's, that's what I realized that um, there is other aspect in life that's equally important, if not more important. Uh, that's sort of when I eventually will have looked back on the decision of becoming a doctor and choosing medicine. I think that experience of... So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, if looking back, the decision of becoming a doctor to um, work on... Uh, to improve other people's health and to help people recover from illness, has something to do with my personal experience that uh, makes me realize that uh, there are other, there's more important in life than just you know getting back to school per se. Um, I'll echo everything that you said about doing what you love because the one thing that you can be sure of is that the climate will change. Your boss will change, the reimbursement models will change, everything will change and so um, you can't hang your hopes and dreams on external factors. You have to really do um, what drives your heart. But the piece of advice that I think I want to give you is to um, find good mentors and to not shy away from feedback. I think the two go hand in hand, because if you look for mentors who only tell you you're doing a good job, then you're really not progressing. But if you have, you surround yourself with people in your life who are able to look at you really, really critically and tell you perhaps areas of your weaknesses that you can work on, or perhaps guide you in directions that you can't even see because that's obviously not the stage in your life where you have that vision, then you have um, a support system by which um, even if you stumble, um, people will be around you to pick you back up and um, keep you on your track. So that does mean going out there and finding individuals for whom you can tell your story to, for whom you can show your essays or your grades or um, share some of the struggles that you're dealing with in a very, very honest way so that they can pick them apart and then guide you towards perhaps a direction that you hadn't seen earlier. Well, medicine for me is actually sort of like arranged marriage. Um, when I, in China, we go to medical school from high school. So when I asked my parents, what should I do upon graduation from high school, he said, apply for medical school, be a doctor. 
That's what I do. That's what I did. So I went to medical school. But I fall in love with it. So it's, uh, it's something that you have to uh, try, uh, even if you're not sure. A lot of children from our, gen from our young, younger generation, they are hesitant to try. So I, I encourage them to try. Just, for example, my birthday, boy, uh, birthday girl today, all right, Cassie, she decided to uh, pursue a medical career. Um, I still remember when she was in middle school and high school when I was trying to talk to her about medicine. She doesn't even want to listen to a word of it. So what I did is later I said, Cassie, you love science, right? She was crazy about science. You go for all kinds of science competitions. And she's very outgoing. She's very talkative. She, she, she'll bore you to death when you, when you she start talking. So I said, Cassie, you like talking to people and you love science. Medicine is a perfect fit for you. That's why eventually she, 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 she realized that, yeah, that sounds about right. So uh, my word to all of the younger generation is don't hesitate to try. Don't be afraid to try. If you, can, if you think you like, like it, you can, you can do it. Okay, you believe in yourself. That's it. So if I can summarize, um, something we talk about very important to you, and you, that can be um, up to your satisfaction your occasions. All right, that's one of the you know, advice. Second, find a good mentor. So you have many good mentors here. Please take advantage. We have so many doctors here, and we have the good attorneys. So good mentoring, that's second you know, advice we're giving you. Number three, you know, that's from Dr. Wang. Keep it trying. If you don't reach where you are, keep it trying until you're sitting on this stage here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. All right, so my questions are done. So now it's your turn, okay? So can we, um, any questions you want to ask? Oh, Dr. Jason Quant. Thank you for uh, that inspiring, uh, all three of you, you know, speeches and uh, life experiences. Now, we have a good mixture of academic and uh, clinical medicine. So given the uh, current environment of the Affordable Care Act, it's probably going to stay and probably it's going to get worse. So I realized that, you know, uh, you gave, the, you know, all that uh, advice, but would you give the same advice to your kids to go into medicine? So, Dr. Tom, Dr. Green, yes. Um, well, I, I go back to my um, first message uh, as to, I still think medicine is a very appealing career choice. Um, it has, you know, interestingly that, you know, before we all started, we're actually chatting on, uh, you know, medicine today is probably not the same as medicine 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, doctor's work is, probably a lot more paperwork based, a lot of uh, sort of bureaucratic based than what it was before. Uh, electronic medical records is a, uh, uh, it, it has a sort of double edged swords and then we are under a lot more you know, governmental scrutiny and regulation compared with before. But on the flip side of things, uh, the, the regulations and the other things came as a reason and then hopefully the reason is to improve quality of the care and that's eventually to help the patients. So uh, from, a, from a sort of pure uh, practice and a, and a practical point of view, being a doctor today is a lot more difficult than being a doctor uh, many years ago. But at the same time, I think the, uh, the appealing part of medicine uh, the kind of service that you provide to save people's lives, to help their quality of life, to, to really treat their illness, that kind of satisfaction stays the same, and I don't think that will ever change. So from that perspective, um, I think I will give my children similar <laughs> advices. I think going to medicine is not for other reasons, but for the reason to help people, and that part is never going to change. To be successful in, in, in medicine, to be successful as a doctor, that probably will change how to become successful. But going into medicine, I don't think that will ever change.
Um, I'm going to echo the advice that Vincent got from his Kaplan um, administrator, which is that being a doctor is an identity. Um, it's a profession. It's not a job. And so it, you really have to have the personality for it. You really have to crave the intimacy that it brings you into people's lives. Um, you really have to love um, being um, there for them when they're the, they're the most vulnerable and in some ways in their ugliest because when they're hurting, people are angry and they lash and they say things they don't mean. So if you have the appetite for it, then this career will, I think, always, always satisfy you. Um, this climate is, of course, different than the climate 20 years ago, which will be different than the climate 20 years from now. But I think at the heart of it, um, I can close all of that away um, when I sit down with my patient um, and reframe. So I can look at the amount of paperwork that I have to fill out and curse the insurance companies and curse the healthcare system and say this is a complete waste of my time. Or I can look at, it, look at it as a way to advocate for what my patients need because maybe that walker is far, far more important to their well-being than the prescription that I can write them. So I think it's how you look upon your work and what it brings to the lives of the people that you're trying to impact that really brings home the satisfaction around what you're doing. I want to just echo uh, Dr. Lin's uh, uh, comment on uh, technology's double-edged knife. Uh, but you utilize the edge that helps. With the evolving information technologies and all the science and technologies, technologies, I think medicine is becoming more and more interesting. That's why I said it's not less interesting, it's more interesting. As from the business part of view, uh, point, I think every year we spend over $3 trillion in the United States. It's a big chunk of money and still a very, uh, a very rewarding profession We go for medicine. So that, that's the, my answer to, to you, Jackson. Uh, just cope with it, adapt with it, like, like the physician community, uh, the Chinese physician uh, community. We all uh, go with the rules and regulations, so the health reform, we go with heads on. We just go do what they uh, recommend to do. And uh, sometimes you have a setback, sometimes you, actually most of the time you get rewarded. So, thank you. Can I just say one more thing, which is that I still think that um, healthcare has more flexibility than a lot of industries. And so I have witnessed my peers go from private practice to academic, research, quality improvement, administration, consulting. I mean, there's ways that you could move around inside the field depending on how the economic climate or, the, or your personal climate changes that offers you something um, to, to everyone. So I, I still do think that there's a lot more flexibility in our field. All right, uh, that question was raised by one of the um, CAP and AYP Singapore you know, members. Now I want to hear something from the, uh, the audience, the parents and the students. The microphone is already over there. Um, so any question you want to raise, or you want to ask any question from the China as Fund, you know, any committee member, you are more than welcome to ask. All right, come to the front. And please, if you have a question ready, just come up to, you know, to the microphone on the side. So recently, President Trump has devoted Justice Department resources to targeting universities that discriminate against white applicants. He has, however, said little about Asian Americans, who, according to critics of affirmative action, have it the worst. Uh, Dr. Wong, you mentioned your initial rejection was because you wrote in Chinese, but do you think it was also because you are Chinese? And Dr. Tommy, Dr. Wen, um, did being Asian close any doors that would have otherwise been open? This is a great question. We've been, uh, the last several years, we've been uh, Chinese or Asian Americans been struggling. Our, our next generation, I, it's hurtful when I look at my kids working so hard and achieve a, a SAT of 2300 and can't even get into any IV, while some other ethnic background, the kids can easily go into all the IV college. So it, it is a um, situation that we have to deal with. I think uh, equality in, in college education is still uh, 
a question when you go, go when you put into this to these uh, countries political environments. Uh, what I can say is we have to fight for it. That's all. Um, I think that is a very poignant question that you raise, and I and I would venture to say that everyone in this room has suffered from the model minority um, myth in some form um, in their academic life. Um, personally, I um, have thankfully not experienced um, any shut doors. Uh, because of that, although I am completely aware um, of the stereotypes that do exist around both me as an Asian person and also me as an Asian woman in a leadership role, um, but I, I guess I consider it part of my job to enlighten people along the way. Um, I'll, I'll echo both of the, uh, the speakers' sentiment over here. Um, when I first came to the country, I have to tell you, I was quite naive to think that uh, equality is a given. Um, but uh, as, as we go along with our lives and you sort of understand, the, the discrimination is not, a, uh, it's not something on your face, but it's something that's, that's subconscious and something that's very much hidden. Uh, but personally, and, uh, uh, and from a family standpoint, that we think, and we have a we have a small we have a very uh, young child at five years old, and then we hate to think about things in that nature to to think about his future and so on and so forth. But what I will say is, uh, ethnic background and the race, and this is uh, in the general public, and we need to be uh, forceful and vocal and fight fight for our own rights. But from an individual standpoint. We cannot really worry about what other people view you just simply from your skin color. And what you need to achieve as an individual and that hardworking spirit that Dr. Wong, Dr. Wong mentioned, like the, the kind of uh, spirit to try to educate people along the way, like Dr. Wong, uh, Dr. Tang mentioned, and that's something I think individually we need to strive for. Um, to do your best, to, to get the best uh, experience and the best records you can get, and that's all you can do. You finished your question? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, anyone? Anyone else? Before you're thinking your own question, uh, let me just share a little bit uh, with um, all the audience here. Uh, just like I say, you know, I've been involved in uh, education you know, for almost my entire life. I just have an uh, opportunity to meet one of the doctors graduate from the uh, Columbia. And uh, that Columbia, uh, these doctors you know, have been helping the Columbia University to interview uh, many uh, potential applicants you know, for the uh, Columbia University. So he had been mentioned about, you know, we mentioned about the race and the, and the um, ethnic you know, uh, students here. Uh, according to what you say, okay, Columbia University, you know, really uh, favors the students, okay, uh, from the northeast regions, not from the uh, the west coast. Uh, but again, you mentioned about the uh, the Asian American students, okay, have been like against, you know, uh, compete each other. And uh, for the many the Ivy League you know, college, they have a certain number of the court, you know, for the different ethnic you know, backgrounds. So you know, he say it's such a shame, you know, it's this is a fact. All right, and how does that going to uh, you know, change that? You know, well, you know, that's something like we gotta work out. We have many outstanding users here, and hopefully, uh, some points, okay, or some of you will be able to become a big voice. All right, and hopefully, some points, you know, uh, this will become uh, the issue. All the uh, the student, no matter what the racing and uh, ethnic background, you'll be able to pursue, you know, what you want. So it's just a lot of things we want to share. Any other question, please? We have been too quiet, yes, and I believe that uh, uh, Shaolin, uh, I want to mention Shaolin. Shaolin is uh, one of our 2017 you know, scholarships and receiving. And the reason I want to mention about him, he, uh, she just arrived in the country last year, okay? And she presents such a wonderful, impressive, I want to share with our committee member. She shared with such a wonderful, outstanding, you know, microfilm. Video. Do you remember when we judging that? You know, it's just such a. But she was here just last year. So welcome to the United States. You know, and you, uh, believe me, you will be one of the outstanding signal you know, leaders in the future. So go ahead, your question. Thank you so much. 
Thank you guys for coming. Um, I want to ask, is there a point in your lives that you decide that doctor is the right path for you, or um, did it happen gradually? If there is a point, what is that point? Thank you. Is it first? <laughs> <laughs> Try to think about some challenging well, questions. Yeah, I don't... thought I said it's arranged marriage for me. <laughs> Basically, my parents have told me when to go to medical school. When do you fall in love with this? Uh, seriously? Well, well, I have two, two, two sets in my career. In China, I was a surgeon, just like Dr. Ming. Not as a you know, great surgeon, but a trauma surgeon uh, with instructions and everything. Uh, I love it. I love the OR. So, in medical school, you learn a lot of knowledge. Sometimes you have to force yourself to remember it. It's not very pleasant because you have to do it, you have to do it. But once you come out to patient contact, especially when you go to your clinical uh, clerkship, you, you apply your knowledge into, into the uh, what you see in patients, you start liking it. And then the time I fall in love is when I was uh, becoming a surgeon and I, uh, I really love the OR. That's my past life. I fall in love twice, okay. <laughs> Second time is, after trying so hard, <laughs> uh, I become an internal medicine internist. And uh, I think the last uh, several years with this whole uh, healthcare changes, the information technology supplying to medicine, I actually start liking medicine a lot because you have to actually cooperate everything together to uh, care for the patient, what they call patient-centered medical home modules. And, uh, I think it's uh, like we said about information technology and medicine. If you mingle both of them together, actually, it's a very lovely science. Um, my office would tell would, would tell you my office uh, uh, staff would tell you that Dr. Wang wants to like to stay in the room too long with patients because he just keep yapping. Anyhow, that's what I love about medicine is talking to people, uh, listening to patients. So. Uh, I guess I don't know how to answer your questions when, but through the through the years of getting into it, you you, you love and love you love it even more. Uh, so uh, like my initial thought saying to you guys is, don't hesitate to try. Um, although I think I knew I wanted to be a doctor early in my life. I definitely tested it to many, many points before I ultimately decided, committed, you know, plunked down the tuition for medical school. Um, so I, you know, worked in a lab. I candy striped in a hospital. I volunteered with the EMT. Um, I basically tried to expose myself to as many um, real life tastes of medicine in order to see if my vision of what being a doctor was like um, met the reality of being a doctor and thankfully most of those experiences only increased my excitement for the field. That isn't to say however that I didn't have doubts along the way and probably one of my uh, darkest moments was during residency when I was on my you know 48th hour working or something um, and had a very very sick patient that I didn't feel like I was impacting. I, I knew I, that I was going to lose him and he was going to die sometime during that night. And I put my head down on the table and I said to myself, I just can't do this. I just can't do this. I'm not cut out for this. I'm too tired. I don't have the emotional resilience and I'm going to lose him anyway. Um, and I remembered um, feeling actually the exact same way when I was learning how to drive. I was driving on the road. I was terrified that I was going to kill somebody. I was terrified that I was never going to make my license. And then I said to myself, look at all the schmoes out there. They're all driving. I can't be any different than them. And so at that moment, I looked up and I looked at the hospital and I said, look at all the schmoes out there. I can't be any different from them. I'm going to make it through the night. Even if I lose my patient, I know that I did the best for them. So um, the road is long and the road is hard and it'll be filled with doubt, but you have to figure out a way to get through it. I don't think I have much more to add to, uh, to Judy's story. That was... Uh, uh, it's very similar experiences. Uh, you, you sort of have to test it out. Uh, I'll highly encourage, uh, well, this goes back to a little bit on the games you have to play when you apply things. So everything you have, if you know you want to try something, you want to try it early. 
Um, we have even seen high school students coming to neurosurgeon's lab trying to say, oh, we want to become a neurosurgeon in high school. Uh, that's not to say that you should fake things, but uh, whenever there is something in your mind you think that may be something you're interested in, just test it out and uh, try it out and see if, if this is something that you will actually persistently have interest in. Uh, volunteering work, uh, emergency room, EMT, uh, those are fantastic things to uh, to have a exposure to get into the field and see if there's if this is something for you. Um, laboratory work and uh, uh, and community service is another thing to test it out to see if you know helping helping other folks and sort of uh, sometimes you have to serve people's needs that you don't necessarily know they had before. Uh, if that's something that gives you satisfaction. Uh, have this kind of experience uh, for you early on, I think that will be very helpful to decide if this is something for you for the future. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, please come up, you know, don't be shy. Um, being a parent, so you, your parents, you have a daughter, you have two daughters, you have any kids? Yeah, one son. Okay, so um, as the parent that you parent, you are a successful doctor, you have good advice to your children, you have all the benefits, you know, uh, but for a, a regular parent that we not a doctor, I'm in an IT field, I'm not a doctor, but I want to encourage my son or as the parent, what can we do to, you know, uh, what the parent can do to encourage the kid get into medical field, or what the kid can do once they make up their mind or they get into medical school, what can they do next? Uh, like for parents, we can just encourage them, okay, get a good grade in school, um, that's all we can do, you know. So, any good advice to any parent out there? You're okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes, actually, it's very uh, good questions. Actually, I, I believe most of the parents will have the same questions. Uh, but I have to say, though, it's you're not an ordinary ordinary parent. We're all ordinary parents. You're not just the only one. Uh, it being a doctor, we have we went through the same thing. How to encourage your kids? How to help your kids go to education? Um, so encourage part I said that already. So uh, see what your kids like. What you know anything anything interested? Like my case, my daughter don't even know what she wants to do, but she loves science and she loves talking to people. I say, hey, medicine might be a good way. So sort of you know uh, discard, let them help them discover what they're interested, in. and then. Once they found their interest, you can help them. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, you go to hospitals to do volunteer. Uh, some doctors or in the community you know, uh, or some organizations like ACAP, we actually help arranging kids uh, to, to go to shadow with uh, different doctors. So just ask around. This, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of help out there. You go volunteer in the hospitals one, go to emergency rooms and, and other things. Let them expose to uh, more uh, more experience, they understand uh, what this job is all about, and maybe they'll, they'll like it. So, um, I was the first physician in my family, so my parents were pretty ordinary and advised me to the best of their ability as well. Um, and I would say that's that's the job of any parent, no matter what skills or uh, prior knowledge they have about the fields that their kids are trying to explore. Um, I will say that wearing my hat as the residency director, um, and then I, I, I would say universally for people in the position where they're selecting for competitive applicants, um, depth is usually better than breadth. So I would encourage if you see your child loving something to continue to pursue that to the height of that, whatever it is, you know, sport or science or um, writing, you know, my, my daughter recently just asked if she could take yet another new class, and I said it's time not to take five new classes, but really to choose one of those and deepen it 
um, to a level where you're either competitive or that you're um, you know, meeting um, other experts in that field. So depth over breadth might be one piece of advice. The other thing is um, your kid probably knows a little bit more about uh, the field that they're entering than you do, and so do be a little bit open to um, hearing about their own instincts about what's good for them. So my parents tried to push me into a seven-year MDP, and, uh, you know, BA MD program, and I knew that wasn't for me, but they heard that that was a more uh, straightforward way to get into medical school. So um, it could be that you're right, it could be that they're right, but um, when there's not a true black or white answer, um, then just be open to uh, the inner um, you know, social workings that I think the children are actually naturally talented at. Um, I, I had a uh, somewhat different experience as, as Judy's. I have way too many doctors in my family, and everybody said, oh, you should just go to medical school. Um, so uh, I had, so my parents, um, my father has three brothers, and all my aunts are doctors. Um, so, uh, so that actually goes back to your question earlier. Uh, so I, I was very much against medicine uh, in the beginning. Uh, it was not until I think junior year high, uh, junior college, that I, I sort of decided this is something I want to do. Even with that personal experience of mine in, uh, in high school myself. Uh, I would, and parenting is actually a new experience for me. So um, I would say that uh, in order to, we, we should probably allow our children to explore things they are interested. Uh, just because we are uh, in certain professions doesn't mean they have to go through the same profession. Um, if anything, our children will probably see how much we work, uh, how much they miss us and uh, uh, how much, in certain, ex uh, in certain circumstances, we actually value our work more than our family, which is probably not correct. Uh, so with that kind of experience, it's actually not very easy for doctors to encourage their children to go into medicine or go into a similar field. Um, for When I look at several colleagues of mine who actually did inc uh, well, encourage or their children sort of succeed in their practice, they usually keep a very open mind in the beginning and never sort of push uh, or never sort of uh, show themselves as, as examples. Oh, look at what I did and you should just do what I do. That's, that's not really the right attitude to do that. Um, so, so I would say that to allow children freedom, especially in their youth, to explore what they want to do, what their true interests and passions are, and then in high school and in college, give certain guidance and structures and say, okay, well, practically speaking, in, if you are interested in this, that, and this, maybe this is a career choice that's more suitable for you. That probably would be the best thing to do. Yeah, uh, I'm parents with two kids. Uh, so right now, I'm a college professor, I'm trying to encourage them to do whatever they want. But then, uh, in terms of uh, medicine, uh, because of, uh, we know that uh, U.S. education, College education and uh, uh, medical education is not cheap. So how, as parents, uh, we can prepare for the financial situation for the best for the kids. At the same time, because we know along this pathway, there's a lot of obstacles. And uh, not only, you know, the parents have the money to support, but also there's other, you know, uh, problems, uh, you know, on the process. So especially for the financial, do you have any kind of like, uh, uh, suggestions on this? You know, I, I really don't have a very good suggestion, but uh, my wife probably do. Uh, <laughs> she probably does have it, and uh, what she suggested is, when some uh, students are, when you have a financial burden, you have carry a big debt, uh, they, you're going to work very hard because you, you know you have some debt to pay back, so sort of like a responsibility, so maybe a student loan. <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid um, that question's a little bit out of my league as well. Although I will share that I did um, uh, take out loans all through my entire college and medical schooling. And it felt like an enormous sum when I graduated and I thought I'd be paying them back for the rest of my life. Um, and I paid them back within 10 years. So, um, and I know 10 years sounds like a long time, but it really isn't. And I lived very comfortably in those 10 years. So, which is to say that 
Um, don't let any doctor fool you when they moan about how they don't make a lot of money. We make a good living. Compared to the rest of the country, we make a good living, and we are, you're completely able to pay back whatever student loans. There are also, obviously, um, loan repayment programs. If your uh, child is interested in working in a um, health professional shortage area um, so that the government can help to subsidize their education and then they have to give back a certain years of service. I mean, those programs are unfortunately tighter in this era of, uh, of funding, uh, but they still do exist. But again, you have to love it. You can't work in an environment that you hate. You have to love it. Um, just to add a couple of other uh, possibilities. Uh, so most medical schools, uh, you know, public or private, have a relatively generous or uh, at least reasonable financial aid package. And myself was beneficiary of that. Uh, so the, uh, the, the burden on the parents is, uh, uh, I, I actually very much like what Winston said. You know, we, we should not, as, as a parent, at least I say this now, if, if my son chooses to go to medical school, he's on his own. You know, I, I'll, help his <laughs> I'll help his college, everything else, is, yeah. he's on his own. And so that's a kind of responsibility we place on children to allow them to grow. I mean, otherwise they will never grow out of uh, their comfort zone. Uh, so, but from from the financial aid perspective, there is definitely uh, uh, very reasonable packages, and the, the loan is, uh, if you qualify, is the sort of zero percent uh, during medical school and the residency. You can defer it a very very long time. So it's not until you are actually working as attending, and then you, you really need to start paying them back. So that's that's why, as Judy said, usually we can reasonably pay them back. Uh, in a shorter period of time and then live relatively comfortably. So. Thank you very much. I want, I want to add um, a comment. If your children is really interested in medicine, don't worry about the financial part first. Work on their interests, work on their preparation to get into medical school. Then you worry about the financial package later on. Like Dr. Tang was mentioning, there is uh, some government uh, program subsidizing um, you know, the student to go into medical school, you know, and you have to pay back, you know, certain years after, um, you know, you graduate. And there's other uh, venue as well, such as you can go into, uh, into Army, uh, Navy, Air Force, you know, again, those are very good opportunities for your, for your student, for your children to go into medical school uh, in, in a different way than, you know, the, the regular financially, you, you have to pay yourself or get a student loan. <laughs> so there are many, many ways of getting in medical school, you know, even though you, you think financially you cannot afford it. And also, there's also something you need to consider. Once you get into medical school, when you have more than one choice, you need to balance between, is it worth it to pay so much extra money to go into a so-called a, a Ivy League school, a, a, a name school versus a public school. So you need to think about yourself personally and say, is it worthwhile for me to spend $200,000 more for that four years to go into a name school versus a public school? You know? So to me, I think um, going to medical school is the most important thing. Whether you go into a state university or a private school, I don't think that makes a difference because, because it is not the school name that you carry will make you a successful doctor. It is what you're going to do in the future that makes you a successful doctor. So don't worry about the financial situation. Just go ahead, do your best preparation you can for, you know, from the student point of view. And for the parents, just encourage them to explore. So if, if medicine is their true love, you know, encourage them and support them in any way you can. Okay. And I have a request. Um, Dr. Tong mentioned, you know, you need to find a good mentor in order to get into medicine. So um, I'm, I'm requesting Dr. Tong, Dr. Wong, and, and Dr. Lin, so that if any one of you are interested in medicine as, as a future career, so maybe you can get in touch with these three doctors here to see what is the opportunity for shadowing them or programs in the hospital, because I know this day it is extremely difficult to find a volunteer job, a volunteer position in the hospital, because the volunteer position in the hospital is limited, and a lot of them, they were being given to the so-called inside people, meaning nurses, uh, doctors, and other employees in the hospital, they already, their children already taken up the position.
So it's somewhat difficult for people who doesn't have that connection. So I, I, I'm requesting these three doctors to open up themselves to allow you know, students to get in touch with them for that opportunity because mentorship is extremely important as part of the preparation for the medical school application. Thank you. So according to Dr. Liang Se, if we all agree, say I. I, come on, you can't say it, so that one. <laughs> all right, um, any uh, speaker, any uh, questions? Because we gotta move on, we still have other parts. Yeah, come up. Oh, this is it, Catherine, I remember her. Yeah. Well, I, I have to answer Dr. Liang's request, yes. <laughs> and Dr. Tang? Be delighted. I want to ask if there were any um, sacrifices that you had to, had to make while going on this route? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, saw, we saw some, um, well, your, your daughter's birthday is today, right? So you're, you're here. Well, that's not that's not, that's not the, the big thing. So I let me. I just, <laughs> I just have too much to say. Um, excuse me. Like to say to my patients, I always talk. Um, the biggest sacrifice we have uh, for me for my life is when I was in medical school here at Nikon. Actually, I sent uh, two of my baby back to China for two years. I uh, missed them desperately. So that's, that's some sacrifice you have to do. You have to go through the medical training here, and we, we have to uh, make some sacrifice. The same thing go to your becoming a doctor, I, I, I believe Dr. Dr. Lin, Dr. Tong. When you're working long hours, you sacrifice your personal life. So you have to be, to be definitely in love with this profession if you uh, want to move forward. So. It's interesting how most of our brains go straight to our families because this is such a demanding profession. Um, I think all of us at some point have to confront the work-life balance question and decide if we're comfortable with how much time we're spending at work versus what we're spending at home. My personal way of um, balancing that question is to ensure that when I'm at work, I'm fully present at work and that I'm very, very comfortable with who's taking care of my kids. And so to that end, I do, um, I've chosen to live close to my parent, my mom and my in-laws so that there's frequent contact for them and with all their cousins. Um, and that I have hired a, um, a nanny, a housekeeper who I've had for 13 years who works for me 12 hours a day. Even though my kids don't need her 12 hours a day anymore, I make sure that she's in the household so that I feel safe. Um, and then when I'm off, I'm off, so that I don't um, bring work home with me uh, very often, and that I ensure that when I'm with my kids, I'm fully present with them as well. Um, so, to uh, to echo Judy and uh, uh, and Vincent's uh, comment, that uh, if you go to medical school interview and uh, if you emphasize on quality of life or life choices, that's probably not the best way to start this out. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there's not much else I'll, I'll add, but I think the, uh, to, have, to have family, especially have children, uh, during medical school and during residency is something that's difficult, but it's not undoable at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I think there is a push in major medical schools and major hospitals to, to be sensitive about uh, their students' need for a personal life. And so, and in fact, a lot, of, uh, a lot of my colleagues will also tell me that uh, in their darkest hours, in their most stressful time, it is their family that gives them the most support. So, uh, medicine is a long journey and sometimes can be a lonely journey, but if you really truly go there alone, you're not gonna succeed. Uh, so you need a good support system, uh, your family, your friends, uh, the people you trust and you're close with, um, and that circle of uh, support is very important going forward. Okay, so you hear that, right? It's a long and a lonely journey, but go for it if that's where you want to go. Uh, any other question? Yes, okay. It's not our, okay, not our I, I, I just wanted to add to that as a spouse of a doctor. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a group effort. It's not just the doctor. 
It's a doctor's wife, the doctor's children, the doctor's in-laws, the doctor's parents. It's a collaboration of everyone's effort because it's a lot of sacrifice. But at the end, if it, you know, if you all understand as a unit, it does work out, and it's it's it is gratifying. And you know, believe it or not, um, children are very very resilient. They understand that you know, mom has to work, dad has to work, and but I think as um, a parent. As a you know working professional parent, when you're at home, you've got to be at home. You know, don't don't be at work when you're physically at home. And I think um, that's what I, I would like to, to you know to share with everybody that it's not as as hard and as bad as it seems. The years go by really fast. Training goes by fast. And I heard that um, the uh, the residency program is a lot better today than it was 20 years ago. I remember my husband came home. After 36 hours, 40 hours, you know, it's 11:30 at night. I'm tired. I gotta get up next morning, you know, because I have we have a young baby. I've gotta get ready. Gotta go to my office, and I'm heating up the food for him. And he's sitting there and he's talking to me, but there's no there's no communication because he's asleep. His eyes are open. He's looking at me, and I'm like Jackson, Jackson. And I said, Well, I think he needs sleep more than he needs food. Put the food back in the refrigerator. He won't starve. He'll, he's got enough, you know, substance to, 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 to carry him for the next day. And life goes on. You know, you juggle. Um, I'm sure you know what Judy says as a, as a working mother. It's hard, but it, it does work out at the end. I mean, our oldest is 29 and my youngest has uh, just turned 22. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And if we survive it, it's, it's actually a very good life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the one just spoke, that's uh, one of our AYP committees. Uh, another child, uh, it's another profession, you know, he's in his attorneys. So next time we're going to have, uh, you know, all the speaker talking about the law. And then we can have Dr. You know, Jason Kwan to uh, come as a spouse to talk about how your experience about. <laughs> okay, uh, any other question? Because we have to wrapping up. Any other question? Uh, if you don't, we don't have time or you feel shy you know, to use the microphone, we're going to have the social hour later and I can see the uh, Sheraton Hotel already prepared uh, one of the wonderful, you know, great you know, fruit for us. So later on you have a chance to find your good mentor, okay, be my guest, you know, you are free to talk to any one of them. So at this point, okay, uh, we are going to thank, you know, can we give a well round of applause for all these wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, you know. Listen to them, okay? Uh, make your life as much easier, and hopefully uh, you will appreciate that. So, you know, as one of the uh, AYP you know, members, we all appreciate, you know, for their presence. So now I'm going to pass the microphone to Dr. You know, Liang, our you know, chairman. Uh, we are going to have our chairwoman, uh, honorable chairwoman, uh, uh, Mona Su. You know, he, he just arrived, he arrived, you know, about 10 minutes ago. Let's welcome, you know, Mona. Yeah, this is our... Honorable chairwoman, and because of the her, we have this, you know, CAP program, you know, uh, the uh, established, you know, about 13 years ago. So thank you so much for your leadership. So now we're going to appreciate our sponsor. You know, we read it with great heart. Thank you for their sponsorship. So I'm passing the phone to the Dr. Liang. Okay, um, we are going to present a souvenir to the three speakers who have given us such a wonderful lecture uh, speech. Uh, their life, about their life experience and answering all these questions. So I'm going to present them a, a appreciation uh, gift, um, which was uh, generous, generously donated by Tiffany at uh, Americana Manhattan. So the first one I would like Mona to present it. Okay, the first one uh, is uh, Dr. Lin. So I'm going to ask our Tiffany sponsor, uh, manager, Melini Gordon, to come up to present the second uh, souvenir.
And we're going to ask uh, Serena Yen of Tiffany also to come up to present the, the final souvenir to Dr. Vincent Wang. Well, as the uh, um, MC of this program, okay, I again I want to uh, say the uh, appreciation to the uh, Tiffany and Co for the sponsorships. Uh, not just all because all this is a, a professional speaker here, but uh, with such a classy and elegant, you know, token appreciation. I guess in the near future we're going to have many, many, you know, guest speakers who would like to come just because of Tiffany. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I'll be here. Okay, uh, let's point out, uh, I'm going to ask that our guest speaker can uh, just go to the back and have a little coffee, relax, because we're going to move on to our second part of the program. And thank you again. And believe it or not, they are going to, all the kids are going to be waiting for to speak to you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thank you. All right, now let's move on to the second part of the program. And this is one of the highlights. And for the uh, uh, China Air Fund, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the programs, you know, okay, like Dr. Liang just mentioned, uh, we have done several programs, okay, and few of them, okay, is in China. And starting 2015, that's where we decide, you know, uh, as all the professional uh, committee members in the CAP, uh, we create the AEYP programs, and then we starting have the ambassador scholarship program starting there 2015. And like the Kristen Hunt, you know, that's the daughter of the Dr. Hunt, is one of the recipient. And then uh, we have the Anna Lewis, okay, that's a 2016 recipient. Uh, you know, uh, this is the time of the year. Uh, many, many of our recipient is uh, study out of town, so they won't be able to make it. But they send the, uh, uh, their best greeting, you know, to uh, upcoming in the recipient for the 2017. So now we're going to present this award, you know, for the 2017 uh, essay contest, you know, uh, scholarship winners. And uh, believe it or not, okay, I want to tell you, uh, this is what this is program is about. Now we set up the topics, you know, and we asked all the uh, high school students and the all the college students for sophomore year and the freshman year to come and participate. Starting the uh, two years ago, we even accept. You know, any piece of the artwork, you know, if they can represent themselves, you know, uh, relating to the topics, or even the microfilm or videos, all right? So, you know, you know, lucky enough, you know, this year we have uh, one of the recipients, okay, is presenting the artwork, I'm going to introduce later. And the other one also have presenting the Michael uh, Field's work, okay, the video, that's the Shaolin uh, Long, okay, she's the one of the recipient. And the topic we have for 2016 is uh, what differentiate you from others you know, as a great leader, or what does it mean to become a leader? And that's the what, you know, all the uh, six in your recipient will uh, have been determined. Uh, 2018, uh, we will announce that in April, uh, when we have the you know, first uh, annual, you know, the uh, leadership forum in April 2018, that's the time we are going to announce. So hopefully, uh, any one of them, I can see many of the faces I know, and I hope they will uh, keep trying to participate in this program. So now, without further ado, let me introduce you, okay, the six. Uh, 2017, okay, uh, Ambassador Scholarship recipient. I'm going to announce one by one so they can come up to the stage to receive their award and a scholarship of one thousand dollars. Hey, now I love that. You know, sometimes I wish if I could go back that you know, 40, 30, 40. I cannot do the math. <laughs> If I can go back again, if I can have so many good mentors and all the good programs, maybe I will be one of them and I'm making my life even more successful as I want to be. So the first one, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Sherry Chen, okay, it's a freshman at the Baruch College and major in business, so I'm going to let her come up. And then at the same time, I would like to have Dr. Dr. Liang, okay, to come up present this is certificate and the one thousand dollars of scholarships, you know, to our winner. Look forward.
Congratulations, you know, Sherry and to the family too. We wonder now, at some point, 20 years, no, 10 years from now, they will be one of our speakers here, so okay, sitting and share their experience. All right, next one, um, can I have uh, Dr. Jason Kwan to be ready? Um, our next uh, recipient, okay, of a scholarship winner, that will be Evelyn Zagai Chong. It's a senior student at the French Louis High School, okay, congratulations. All right, our third recipient is Madison Lin. Madison Lee is a summer student at the Horace Mann School. It's one of the uh, uh, private school. Can I have the Nana Chow to come and present this award uh, to Madison Lee? Please come up. All they are receiving, okay. So being on the side because we're going to have the photo taken, okay. The group photo taken. Next person cannot have the uh, Kahe Mays, all right. It's a senior student at the Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Tech, you know, high school. It's uh, our next person to receive the scholarships and the certificate. So, can may I have the Dr. Vincent Wang to come and present this award? Dr. Want. Oh, I forgot to mention, okay, uh, Anthony Chang, uh, she presented her piece of the artwork and it wins all the uh, impression for the community member. And you can see it from the side. This is a, her uh, piece of artwork. Uh, you can recognize the character, that's the Moonlight. And she had the wonderful, you know, we're going to put on uh, our website to share with you. So uh, if you watch, you know, Chai is interesting to participate in this program. Uh, we have the, our uh, contact information for the you know, next year, and Frances Liu is uh, our administrator, you know, so uh, feel free to talk to her to, for, to get all the uh, information. And next person, uh, I'm going to have the Xiaoling Rang to come up to the stage to receive the, you know, her award. And the presenting award will be our birthday girl, that's the Ming Der Yang, Dr. Ming Der Yang, to come up to represent the uh, award. And, uh, Darling Ron is a sophomore student at the Avenues, okay, the War School. It's a very, uh, very, you know, private school. This is a private school in the city, so, okay, congratulations. The last is not the list, it's, uh, Aung um, San Felicia Yao, um, she's uh, the last uh, recipient for this year, 2017. It's a senior student at the Benjamin Cardozo High School. So congratulations, please come up the stage. And guess who's going to present this award? Miss Yan Chu, that's me. I'm going to present the award. Recipient, okay, standing out the front of the stage, and we're going to have the group photo. Yeah. 
And then can I have all the guest speaker to join the forum? Uh, can I have a Dr. Lin, Dr. Tang, okay, and uh, Dr. Wang, and all the AAYP program, and uh, our honorable chairwoman to come up to take this group photo to thank you for all their efforts. And I think they all deserve your well round of applause, right? <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, congratulations. All right, um, at this point now, uh, we have about 45 minutes, all right? Um, all the parents and the students, uh, you're gonna enjoy, um, again, Shira Chan Hotel, you know, this is like a five stars, you know, the hotel. Uh, enjoy the, you know, the wonderful uh, the dessert and the coffee, anything that you like. And take the time to talk to all the, uh, the mentors. Not only the other uh, three speakers, okay, uh, we have our chair, honorable chairwoman, Monad, okay, it's a great person to talk to. Uh, we have the uh, Dr. Minder uh, Young, and we have Dr. Kwang, and we have many members, okay, please speak to them, all right? But at this point, uh, before I end it, I'm gonna ask my, uh, my co-chair, you know, uh, chairman, Dr. Jason Kwang, to say the uh, closing remark, Dr. Kwang. Vincent, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Jesus Christ's disciples are fishermen. <laughs> they're also he fish. they're also healers too. Oh. So you know what? And you know what? Where they are now? They're sainthood, right? They're saints. So you have the potential of being sainthood. <laughs> Thank so you. Be before I, uh, you know, give my closing remarks, I think we should give uh, thanks to Yen Chu and, uh, and Francis. For, for really, you know, making this forum into a big success. So next year, 2018, we're going to have two more of these forums. So I would encourage the audience and, uh, and, and your friends to actually uh, give us not only feedback with today's forum, but also give us some type of uh, feedback in, in you know in terms of future uh, 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 forums. Okay, what topics that you want to hear about? If you want to hear about legal issues, if you want to hear about financial issues, if you want to hear about fashion, something that's entirely different, let us know because China Aid Funds has the resources to actually go out there and um, and get people to in the who are leaders in their field to come and speak. So on behalf of China AIDS Fund Board, we want to thank the speakers for their inspiring life stories. Uh, and also, plus, I want to you know, say that my wife gave a very good um, all-around picture of what a spouse is like during my training and my residency and also my attending. So, uh, in closing, I want to say thank you for all com for coming, and uh, I'm sure that you want to get out and uh, speak to all our speakers. So, um, thank you. All right, just a, a lot of things. All right, uh, please make sure we will have your contact information so we know how to inform you for the near future. Okay, for any upcoming the forum and any uh, you know programs that right, we offer for the youth. Number two, uh, also let us know what you would like to hear. Today is, you know, medicine in a medical area. So next time we'd like to have uh, business, you know, finance, anything you like, okay? With Tiffany's and the Corp, the sponsorship, I would love to sit in here and receive that black. <laughs> so uh, let us know what you like to hear, okay? And we will do as many as possible we can. And thank you for all the, you know, commitments and the devoting, you know, uh, the uh, uh, committee uh, members. Thank you for their hard work because you know they are busy. All the doctors, you know, and the attorney, they are so busy, but they're willing to put in the time just for you. So um, we would like to see you again. And I see many faces I have seen before, and I want to see a lot of new faces. And one day, I hopefully, the entire Sheraton Hotel will be packed 
just because of CAP, AAYP program. Agree? Yes. Thank you so much again. Okay, I'm proud of the CAP. Thank you for your coming. So now let's have a happy hour. Thank you so much.